Hello there, and good morning. Wherever you are tuning in from, whether that be in uh, St. Andrews or elsewhere, we're just glad to have you with us this Sunday. Now, if this is your first time with us, you might be wondering, what is this, us? Well, uh, before I get sidetracked by my own question, like I typically do, let me just say that the us that I'm referring to is our church community here at Cornerstone where we feel that an inseparable part of what it means to follow Jesus is to fulfill our call to love and serve one another. This shared call to each other is not simply naive, wishful thinking, but it is grounded in our shared humanity and in our belief that God has created each and every one of us out of his own love for us. So whether... Um, whether you have maybe more than a few gray hairs, or maybe you were just born this past week. Uh, we hope that our gathering together, albeit online, will communicate this call to love. So before we dive into uh, the worship this morning, I'll be reading this communal call to worship. And if uh, you'd like, uh, feel free on your own to read out loud uh, the bold part with me. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Come, let us all worship and bow down together. Let us kneel together before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Thank you. 
Father God, just as V said, um, we want to live as your community, your people, uh, with our lives here on earth, knowing that um, the angels actually are worshipping you also in heaven. I think of the Lord's Prayer, which talks about your will be done on heaven as it is on earth, or on earth as it is in heaven. But the fact that with Jesus you came and you have brought something of eternity to us here on earth. Lord, this morning as we think about how you made us to live, what you purposed life for, I pray that you'd give us wisdom to trust you, wisdom to not jump to assumptions of our cultural perspective, but rather wisdom to try and see a broader picture. We know that we're never going to see things with the view that you have or with the heart or understanding that you have. But yet by your spirit, you do say that it is possible for us to know the mind of Christ. And so, Lord, for all of us seeking you this morning, we pray that you would help us to trust you, to follow you, to understand your purposes. And we pray in Jesus' name. What do we say at the end? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Xander and Louis. <laughs> well, uh, before we continue our series on Colossians this week, we have uh, just a few notices. Um, so uh, five minutes after this service is done, uh, we will have our coffee, uh, our time for coffee and chat. Uh, this is just a great time to um, uh, see and interact with other uh, people within uh, Cornerstone and also to probably uh, make fun of myself. Uh, and so uh, if you'd like to join that, that's once again, five minutes after the uh, the service and the link will be in uh, the link to the Zoom. Uh, the Zoom link will uh, show up after the service on the screen. And uh, we'd love uh, for you to join uh, just for a quick uh, 10 to 15 minutes um, uh, to chat. Um, next up, um, so we have our evening services uh, 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 tonight. And uh, this is just a, a short in-person service uh, taking place at St. Andrews, St. Andrews in town. Um, if you're like me, uh, uh, you know, this has always been a highlight of the week because we're able to physically meet with each other, uh, listen to just a short message, enjoy the live uh, worship and also uh, receive communion. Uh, so uh, if, if you'd like to come, um, uh, just uh, sign up online as uh, spots are uh, limited. Um, but yeah, um, coming up also uh, this Friday on the 21st, uh, we will have uh, another Chalmers Graduate Learning Exchange at uh, 7.30 p.m. This is a, a great opportunity uh, basically to find out and, and learn about what other Christians are researching on and to see how it relates to uh, their faith and our faith and also uh, vice versa. Um, so this week, uh, this week's graduate learning exchange uh, will be with our very own Fernanda, who is doing a, a PhD in film studies here uh, in St. Andrews. Uh, so for this learning exchange, she'll be presenting on cinema, politics, and power. And this will be with a Q&A uh, following that. And so if you're interested, you can find uh, the Zoom link uh, for that on either the Chalmers website or uh, the Chalmers Facebook page. Uh, speaking of uh, Chalmers, in addition to the Graduate Learning Exchange, uh, one other uh, great part of Chalmers that I'd like to talk about is the Investor Internship. Uh, so this is a, a year-long internship run uh, by both Chalmers and Cornerstone. And it's ideal for anyone who's recently graduated from uh, uni or anyone who just in general who would like to uh, start uh, and, and learn being involved in in ministry. Uh, this is actually what I've been doing uh, uh, myself, um, uh, along with uh, Matthew, Matthew Graham, if you know him. Uh, we've been doing that for the last uh, year, and it has been a great opportunity for me, and I've grown in so many different ways, uh, not only by being invested in by the uh, great pastoral team and leadership team above Cornerstone and Chalmers, but also in having to participate in the joy myself of investing in the church community here uh, at Cornerstone. 
Uh, and so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can uh, email uh, Rebecca Giles and her email should uh, show up on the screen. Or you could uh, reach out to myself or Matthew, uh, perhaps, and, and um, uh, to, to learn more about it, uh, about uh, Invest Here. And uh, speaking of invest uh, and investing, if you yourself would like to contribute to um, the work that's being done here at Cornerstone and the greater St. Andrews community, one way to do that is financially. And so uh, just on the screen, there should be a couple of options, um, um, some online options uh, to uh, give, whether that uh, would be a one-time uh, investment or if you are like me and forget all the time, a recurring uh, investment uh, that will uh, that uh, would happen automatically. Um, and uh, if you're newly uh, joining, uh, please feel no obligation uh, to give. Uh, we're just glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, next, uh, we have, uh, next I will um, uh, pray to uh, dismiss the kids. Uh, the kids now, um, uh, the parents uh, should uh, receive, be receiving an uh, email from uh, Michelle uh, Redfern with the link to the uh, next uh, Holiday Club video. Um, and uh, so at this time, uh, I'll be praying to dismiss uh, the kids uh, today. Uh, dear Father, um, thank you so much for uh, the kids of Cornerstone. Um, thank you so much for their energy, for uh, their uh, enthusiasm, for their being a real um, a, a real life, um, uh, showing the real life of, 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 of the church. I pray that as a church, um, we can take heed of uh, the words of your son to be like uh, children when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. And that uh, we ourselves, no matter how old and how serious and grown up we become, that we too can have uh, the same uh, uh, joy and, and enthusiasm that uh, the kids do. I pray for them as they uh, go on to uh, to watch uh, their the, the holiday club video. I pray that um, they will have a great time um, uh, of fun and also a great time to learn more about you. And I pray that this just uh, instills a... Um, uh, a habit within uh, themselves uh, throughout uh, this week in their own school or and throughout their entire life uh, to grow uh, more uh, um, uh, in you and, and to love you. And yeah, in Jesus' name I pray. Uh, amen. Now, um, the very last thing, but before we go right into uh, the service, uh, I just want to share one of the greatest pieces of advice I remember receiving from, some, from someone in Cornerstone. And this was actually just right before lockdown. And the advice was, you know, to bear, paraphrase, basically like this, to view my time in St. Andrews, not as just a mere stepping stone, but actually a viable time in of itself to not just grow, but to build lifelong relationships and to invest in things uh, that will have uh, Life, lifelong uh, um, effects far beyond uh, moving on from uh, St. Andrews. The person that uh, gave me this advice was uh, Sarah Joss. And, uh, you know, such is fitting as we will now be bringing her uh, and her husband, husband Matthew and their son Brandon on to ask them about what's next uh, for them as they themselves are now transitioning uh, from St. Andrews after spending a couple of years here. So at this time, um, Jared and the Josses turn, uh, turn. Oh, there you go. Uh, and uh, we can uh, start asking them. We can start asking them. Yes, we can start interrogating yes. them. <laughs> yeah. um, Matthew, Sarah, Brandon, I do just, I think that was a lovely story, V, and you have definitely epitomized that yourselves of really embedding yourself, not only in Cornerstone, but in the wider community in St. Andrews. And you've been a wonderful part of our community and you've made an impact on the community as a whole. So we're going to really miss you and we're really thankful um, for the impact that you've, you've, you've had. So just very briefly, um, whoever wants to answer, would you tell us a little bit about, V and I are just going to pray for you now, but what could we be praying for? Um, 
what are you excited about, about as you guys return to the States and what God's calling you to, and maybe what, if there's anything that you're, you're nervous about, or just let us know how, how can we be praying and what would you like the community to know as you head on? Oh, uh, well, and I apologize if our camera freezes, our internet has of course decided to die at the last possible moment. Um, well, we have the, the journey back, so you can pray for that, that we uh, won't come back with a positive COVID test and get stuck in a hotel for the next two weeks. That'd be somewhat awkward. Um, and then we have, I guess for me, because I haven't quite finished my PhD yet, and so I'll need to do last minute revisions after I arrive and submit soon afterwards. Uh, and then there'll be kind of job sort of things as well um, as we, you know, try and move forward with that. And then for all of us, as we, uh, we kind of adjust back to, to being in the States again. Is yep. that it? Any more? Brandon, what is, what is one thing that you're excited about as you move back to the States? Well, I'm excited about the fact that I get to see people who I haven't seen for some of them three or four years, three, two or three years. Uh, um, I'm excited because my birthday is coming up. Ah, important things. Nice. Well, great. Okay. Well, V, why don't you get us started and then I'll, I'll pray as well. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Josses, for what, for being a part of our community. And I'm really excited for what God is going to be doing in and through you as you return to the States. So V. Sure. Uh, dear father, uh, thank you so much. Um, just um, for the Josses, uh, for Matthew, Sarah, and Brandon, uh, just for their entire time that uh, you have gifted them and uh, gifted actually to us here at Cornerstone um, uh, in, in the past few years of, of being here. Um, I pray for uh, them as they uh, travel, make the arduous uh, um, journey uh, back to uh, the States with uh, not only all their uh, uh, you know, personal physical belongings, but all their memories that uh, they have uh, 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 received from uh, their time here in St. Andrews. Uh, I pray that, uh, I pray for um, uh, the uh, the uh, necessary um, list of, of items that still need to be done uh, related to St. Andrews, even after they come uh, back to the States uh, uh, with Matthew's uh, uh, PhD. Um, uh, but also uh, that um, uh, um, for the next stage and uh, Matthew looking for a job and uh, getting settled and uh, starting this uh, next stage of life. I thank you for um, each and uh, every one of them and, and for everything that they've uh, 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 contributed um, and everything that I've learned from them in the past few years. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for the Josses. I thank you for Brandon and the um, just the mind that you've given him for his creativity and intelligence. And I pray your blessing upon him in this next phase, that he would enjoy seeing people that he hasn't seen for a long time, um, and that he would flourish um, as he returns to the States, and that this next phase of life would be one full of joy and growth and learning. Thank you for Sarah and for her gifts, um, for getting alongside other people. We thank you for the the the, the group that she's led of, of many women in our community and for the way that she served them over these last few years. We pray that she would be being supported by other like-minded people as she returns to the States, but that she'd continue to be able to find avenues to use those gifts that you've given her of support and of discipleship and care. We thank you for, for Matthew. I thank you for the way he sees his work as a way to serve your kingdom, to answer people's questions and to, um, display the rationality of faith, the way that faith in Jesus makes sense. So I pray that he would bring this work to a conclusion in a way that satisfies him. I have no doubt that the quality will be excellent, but uh, I pray that he would be satisfied with his time and that you would be giving him opportunity to use those gifts going forward to serve um, people that are questioning you or that are far from you or people that are that have questions about their faith. We thank you for the Josses. We ask that your blessing would go with them. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Over to you, V. Thanks, Jared. Thanks to Justice. We'll always miss um, um, the, the latest uh, invention that Brandon uh, shows me and excitement. <laughs> uh, so uh, now um, we will uh, turn to uh, Jill who will uh, pray for us and that will be followed by a fun little uh, introductory video uh, right before the reading of scripture and uh, the sermon. Morning, Cornerstone. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you this morning in awe of who you are. We thank you that we are finally beginning to be able to meet more and more in person as restrictions lift and places start to open up again. Father, we pray that you'll be that you will go with each of us as this takes place where for some this may bring excitement and for others this may bring apprehension and fear. You created each one of us. You know our deepest fears. You know our weaknesses. But you made us in these places with insurmountable love and we thank you that you promise to never leave us nor forsake us. Father, will you fill us with your peace this morning? We also pray for our mission partner, Kingdom 2000 who seek to bring the gospel to young people around schools and churches in Northeast Fife. We pray, Lord, that you will bless these young people as events return in person, that you will provide opportunities and open doors for the volunteers to serve in new and old places. Thank you, Lord, for the time of prayer and fasting we as a church were able to have on Wednesday. We lift each of these prayers up to you and ask, Lord, that you will continue to prepare our hearts and minds for what is to come as our church goes through a time of change. We trust you as our main leader. We trust you with the future and we fix our eyes on you, our guide who sees everything from the beginning to the end. Continue, Lord, to challenge each of us through the teaching of your word and through relationships with others around us. May we be willing to be formed into the image of Christ, even when it may be uncomfortable. We are your children, who you love equally with in immeasurable love. Help us, Lord, this morning to learn how to love others with the same kind of deep and unconditional love which you have for each one of us. Father, you want us to be obedient to you. This you do ask of us. And we pray, Lord, that we as a people and as a church will hear your voice and be obedient to what you have for us next. We yield ourselves to you as we live in this side of heaven. We thank you for everything that you've done and continue to do in this church. As members of this family in Cornerstone leave and new members join, we thank you that you provide us with a body of believers to grow and live alongside with sharing the highs and lows of everyday life. Thank you for the relationships that you've cultivated in this community. Father, for all these blessings we have received, we turn back to you in praise, giving you the glory because you are so, so good. In Jesus' name, amen. Steak, any kind. Um, broccoli, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the social? <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Alexandra Ocasio Cortez. Okay. <laughs> what country could the UK learn from? New Zealand. should be learning from us. <laughs> the patriarchy. Um, call me CNN and nihilism. Well, to abandon ideology. Essentially, yeah, to abandon ideology. That everybody is of value and worth despite how they 
choose to vote and how they choose to look at the world and that it's possible to love people who don't love others the way you think they should. I would say like the whole concept of conservatism is essentially being radically individualistic. Like, I mean, Christ corporately saves his bride the church. Yeah. Well, well, it places your identity less in works. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, conservative work ethic, right? It's the idea that your your responsibility is fundamentally in your works and what you do, whereas the Christian idea of identity is fundamentally rooted in God's love for you in Christ. So I think that that is radically reoriented. Yeah, I mean, I think today there's a big emphasis on like council culture, for example, especially amongst liberals, and that's quite difficult as a Christian to say, yeah, we absolutely should not value what anybody says ever because I disagree with them on this one point. Um, I find that very difficult. And yeah, I think a lot of the time liberal political liberalism can be associated with autonomy and kind of, you know, everyone having their own autonomy, whereas which I believe in, but also I believe that God is sovereign. And so to have that is quite, yeah, they're two quite juxtaposing ideas. The idea that loving your neighbour sometimes means doing things that they will find hard or disagree with. Let's pray a prayer of illumination. Father God, by your Holy Spirit, would you open our minds as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. May we be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Amos chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Our second reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 1. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If the Bible is the best book we have on morality, it should get slavery right. Because slavery is one of the easiest and most consequential questions we have ever had to face. And the Bible gets it wrong. So says uh, Sam Harris. I know that as we read that passage, um, people, many of us will have reactions against it. I, I hope that all of us are uh, have enough, um, are, are embedded enough in our culture to know that these are some of the most difficult verses in scripture for uh, many people today. It's one of the things that turns people off to the Christian faith. And this belief that Sam Harris says here, that the Bible gets these moral issues wrong, that it gets slavery wrong, that it gets misogyny wrong, is increasingly widespread. It's one of the things that I think is driving um, young people away from faith in Jesus. So what we're going to do this morning is simply present an argument for why that is completely incorrect. Why the Bible, why the Apostle Paul, who wrote those words that Lily just read, gets issues of equality, issues of misogyny, issues about slavery, absolutely unequivocally correct. And in fact, that the Bible has not only can be 
a source for equality and justice today. But historically, the, the Bible has been the fundamental and perhaps even the most influential source for equality, the most influential source for fighting against slavery, and the most influential source for fighting against misogyny, even though, of course, it's also the case that I think people have misunderstood its message and used it to say the very opposite. Now, I know that might sound like a provocative and a big claim after the passage we just read, because many of us will hear those words from the Apostle Paul and we'll think it's saying the very opposite. We'll think that it is actually promulgating a message of inequality. And so I think there's two reasons why we are liable to misunderstand what the Apostle Paul is saying. And by the way, both Christians and non-Christians are liable to misunderstand what the Apostle Paul is saying, because as I said, many Christians have used words like this uh, to actually defend forms of inequality. But there's two reasons why we miss it. The first reason why is this, um, and it's ha a basic, basic principles of biblical interpretation. Most of us, or maybe that's not fair, but there's been many times where people have not been willing to take the time to look at what's sometimes called the original context of scripture. We don't take the time to look at what was Paul saying in his own time, in his own context. And weirdly enough, paradoxically enough, strangely enough, if you don't take the time to understand what Paul was saying into his original context, you will often wrongly think that you can apply what he said directly to your own context. See, if you don't actually take the time to understand what it means in its original context, you will misunderstand that in applying the Bible, there's always two steps. The first step is what did it mean then in its original context? And then the second step is what does it mean now in our context? And those are not usually the exact same. And there's tons of examples of why if you want to take the Bible seriously, you have to take that approach. Here's three, but there's tons. If you go to a church that doesn't greet one another with a kiss, if they don't do the little French thing where they kiss one another on one side of the cheek, they're not applying the Bible the way they did in the first century. If you go to a church and you see men with long hair, there's some beautiful undergrads, undergrad men at Cornerstone with glowing, with long flowing locks, with hair that women would die to have. If you go to a church where men have long hair, they're not applying the Bible the way they did in the first century. If you think it's not wrong for someone to seek restitution when they've been robbed, you're not applying the Bible they, the way they did in the first century. And we can talk about braiding hair. We can talk about head coverings. We can talk about the widow's lists. There's all sorts of ways in which we don't actually, even though some, we, many, many Christians are inconsistent in this. They think that they're just doing exactly what the church did in the first century, but really they just pick and choose certain rules. The truth is that if you want to treat the Bible as an authority, if you want to take it seriously. And some of you Christian are not Christians and you won't want to. But if you do, you have to be willing to be consistent and to do that two-step process. First, take the time to say, what did it mean in its original context? And then realize there's another question of saying, how does that then apply in our very different context? And by the way, that's exactly how Christians interpret all of those texts. We'd say that we don't apply it the exact same way, but the principle, the sort of moral behind each of those commands, we actually do apply. And I won't have time to go through how we do that this morning, but there's a second reason as well. So the first reason why we misunderstand this text and we think it's supporting inequality is because we don't take the time to read the Bible in its original context and ask that second question about what it means in our context. But the second reason is because Paul is radically and even, you might even say uh, in a revolutionary way, pro-equality. But his vision for equality will offend almost all contemporary political and social ideologies. That's why we played that video. That's why, by the way, I think Alice and Sam were brilliant. And what they were willing to do there is to say that whatever side we are on socially and politically, the gospel of Jesus Christ presents a challenge to us. And Paul and Jesus are radically pro-equality, but the version of equality they stand for will offend you. And it should offend you. It should challenge you. Whether you are on the right or the left, whether you're a communist or a libertarian. See, what often happens in today's society, and this doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, is that we want someone who tells it like it is. 
We want someone who is prophetic. But oftentimes what we find is a social commentator or a YouTuber or a writer or a pastor who is very, very prophetic, who calls it like it is, but who only calls out one side of that social or political divide. There's tons of right-wing champions who own the libs, if you're talking in political terms or in Christian terms, who constantly call out the culture. And they will make you feel deeply uncomfortable and deeply challenged, but only if you're on the other side of the political or social divide. If you agree with them, you'll never be challenged. The exact same thing happens on the left. We want someone who will call out the power, who will take down the patriarchy, who will tear down embedded systems. But it never calls into question the sacred cows of the liberal consensus. What is so, one of the reasons, one of the things I think you cannot replicate if you are not a religious person, and I know this is a bold thing to say, but one of the things that I worry about as we as a society drift from religion is that one of the beautiful things about a religion like Christianity is the fact that there is a Bible and there is, we believe that Bible is interpreted to us by the Holy Spirit that questions us, that calls us into account. See, the point isn't left and right or bad, be a moderate. You didn't hear Sam or Alice say that. I'm not saying it. The point is that if you have a Bible, if you have a sacred text that you can't control, <clears throat> excuse me, then whatever ideology you adopt, there will be something to question you, to challenge you, to say, are you really advocating for justice as much as you're convinced you are? Or are you actually advocating for justice and equality in a way that is just? And see, this is what Paul's going to do this morning. He's going to give us a radical vision for equality. He's not going to support slavery. He's not going to support misogyny, but he will make you feel uncomfortable. And if you truly want to contend for equality and injustice, the best, the most ethical thing you can do is be willing to be questioned, to be willing to have your own commitment to justice called into account. And that's what will happen this morning. So first step, let's do what we said we were going to do. Let's read this text in its original context. What would it have meant to Paul's first hearers? Well, the first thing we should notice is that it's not a coincidence that Paul just so happens to pick out three relationships, uh, wives to husbands, children to fathers in particular. Notice it's not, he doesn't talk that much about mothers and slaves to masters. Why does he just so happen to pick those three relationships? Well, the reason is because he's entering into a discussion that was already ongoing. He's entering into an ongoing discussion in the Greek and Roman world, what is sometimes called the Greco-Roman world, about how the household should be organized. And so I'm going to give two examples of this, but these are what you might call paradigm examples. They're examples of how many people in both the Greek and Roman world would have thought. So if you pick up Aristotle's book called Politics, it's actually Politics One. He has two books called Politics. And you open the first chapter, so to speak, what you will find is a discussion of three relationships. Husbands to wives, fathers to children, and masters to slaves. Paul is entering into a conversation. He's entering into the assumptions of that society. So here's how they would have understood the way those relationships work. If you keep reading, and by the way, I'm showing my work a little bit this week because I know this is going to be controversial for some. It should be challenging. So if you keep reading politics one, chapter one, um, what you will find is Aristotle says that um, because everyone is, all these people are humans. They all have a human nature. They all have the same human nature in that sense. But the way they embody that nature is different. Men are more rational. Men have certain sorts of virtues. And those particular virtues that men have uh, make them fit to lead. They make them fit to be in charge. They make them fit to rule. Women are, they, they are also humans. They have the same nature, but they're less rational. And the virtues which they have, the capacities and qualities which they are born with, uh, make them less fit than men to lead. So they, they, they serve in the household, but part of their job is to create enough, a situation where the man is freed up to be the one involved with politics, with society, with religion, and the woman serves under him. Now, slaves are 
similar to women in that they have less uh, rationality and different virtues than masters, but they have even less than the women. So Aristotle says in this that women are naturally inferior and that some people were born to be slaves. So um, again, slaves are human. He critiques the barbarians who treat slaves like beasts, but they're a sort of human that is less rational. And because of the sorts of humans they are, they are not fit again to rule or to command or to lead. They're fit to serve. Now, you can see what kind of society this would create. It would create a society that is remarkably unequal. And when we move forward to the Roman times, to the times more around when Paul was uh, writing, um, this sort of understanding of who persons are created a system of law, which basic, and, and Roman law changed loads um, because it was obviously a, a, a civilization that went along for centuries, but all of the different laws were built on basically putting in place that kind of system where you have what's called the pater familius, the male head of the household, and everyone else under him. And they were under him because it was a, you might even call it a complementary system. This was the best way for them to be how they were made to be. They were rational, but less rational. They had virtues, but less virtue. And so this led to what, from our perspective, would be very shocking uh, aspects of law, very unequal aspects of law. If you just, again, I'm showing my work a little bit in case people are want to want to discuss this later. But if you look up the Cambridge Companion to Roman Law, and you look up the section on family, this is the very very standard stuff here. It describes the role of the pater, pater familius as having autocratic power, basically having almost absolute power over everyone in his household. Basically, no one else has any rights. Almost all of the rights are given over to that male head of the household. So much so that at certain points in Roman history, and this changed eventually, but a father could um, employ capital punishment with his children. The father could sell his children into slavery for set periods of time if he needed money. A father could, a, a husband could marry his wife in absentia. That means the, the husband didn't need to be present for the marriage ceremony, but the woman did. The, again, this was only at one point in Roman history. All these things were different in different times, but the, the, the marriage ceremony at that time, the key moment was when the wa woman was brought into the household of the man. The key moment wasn't vows. The key moment wasn't commitment. The root of marriage wasn't about love. The root of the marriage was about the woman being brought into the household of the man under his authority. Therefore, the woman had to be present for the marriage so she could be brought into the household. The man didn't. I think you're getting the point. In the Greek and Roman world, we are entering into a radically unequal society where the man has autocratic power over uh, women, children, and slaves. And the reason is because he is intrinsically different. While they're all humans, they have different roles built in the way they were sort of made to be, the sort of rationality and virtue, the qualities, the intrinsic qualities they each have. And Paul, in this chapter, sets out to utterly undermine and critique this view of humanity and view of the household from within. This is a subtly and implicitly revolutionary text. It begins with what is as central an idea for Paul as any. It is part of the root of what he understands the gospel to be. If we want to understand these verses at the end of Colossians, we have to remember what we read last week. There's no Gentile or Jew. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or, uh, barbarian or Scythian. Scythians were these people that were basically considered low class in that culture. There's no slave or free. Christ is all in all. And he repeats this idea at three different points, including saying there's neither male nor female. This is as central to the gospel for Paul as anything. To summarize an incredibly complex view, Paul is saying, if you really believe, that the creator God of the universe, the one who the psalm says is the great king above all gods, if you believe he became a man, that he, as to describe his own self-chosen designation, became a servant of everyone, that he died for everyone, and that every human being by an act of faith can be unified 
to the God of the universe, can actually begin to put on Christ, which means to put on the qualities as a human that describe God. In other words, you have a, you have a society that has gods everywhere that views the highest person in society, the emperor, as a godlike figure that the, the, the male head of the household, by the way, was the mediator into religion. Women didn't go directly to God. They basically went to God usually through their paterfamilias, with some exceptions, some cults that became very popular precisely for that reason. But nonetheless, what Paul is saying is that every single person can actually take on the qualities of Jesus Christ immediately by faith in him and that God came to serve them. God came to serve the people we think are slaves. God came to relate directly to the people we think are good for nothing but service. This is a revolutionary view. And he says, if you really get this, you realize all these other distinctions are annihilated because it is so incredible. It's a new vision of what it means to be a human. It's a new, you might say, ontology, a new description of what a human is that's directly attacking the Greek and Roman one that we hear in people like Aristotle. And by the way, Aristotle has some great things to say. I'm not anti-Aristotle, but he's a good example of how people thought. So what Paul does in this text then is he takes, this is the root. This is the core. We all have radical equality in Christ. And then he looks at the situation as it stands. He looks at the household that all of these people are born into. And he tries to remake it from the inside out. He does that in at least three ways. First, he redoes it by remaking the motivation for why people should be a part of his household and participate in his household. Look at what he says. Why should wives submit to their husbands? Because it's fitting in the Lord. Why should children obey for their parents? Because it pleases the Lord. Why should slaves obey their masters? Because they all have the same master in heaven, which is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Why should masters be kind to their slaves? Because they have a master in heaven. In other words, in every circumstance, why does he say a child should obey their parents or a wife should obey their husbands? This is going to be shocking for some of us. He doesn't say wives should submit to their husbands because wives are different. Women are different. Women were made and they're better at serving and men are better at leading. That's what Aristotle said. That's what the Greco-Roman world thought. Paul says no. It's because of Jesus. If Jesus, the God of the universe, who is naturally better than you, served you, then you can serve someone who's not any better than you, who you, the man, the woman are one in Christ. You're absolutely equal. But if you find yourself in this, in this situation, you can serve, not because that person is better than you, not because of the natural differences or capacities that everyone in this society would have appealed to, but because of who you are in Christ, because Christ served you. This alone has already completely revolutionized the system from the inside out, because it doesn't affirm that the reason you obey is because masters are better than slaves, or because, uh, well, I'll get into some other reasons it's not the case either. It does it because of what Christ has done for you. You're actually called to serve others because of your equality with them, and ultimately because of what Christ has done for both of you. So that's the first reason the motivation is totally changed. But the second reason, the second thing to note about this is note what bits, Paul very carefully picks out certain bits of this household system that was, that was applying in the Greek and Roman world to affirm. And there's a bunch of bits he says nothing about which basically what I think what, what what he's doing there is he's he knows this is the world that people are brought into. He knows it's there, but he's not affirming it. It's just the situation people are born into. So what he basically does is he affirms the obligations that, that can be transformed by this Christian vision of love and equality, and he ignores all of the rights which actually make the system work. So notice he says, wives submit your husbands. Where do you say husbands, your wives um, owe you submission. He says, slaves, obey your masters. Where does he say masters? Because you're the master, um, your slaves have to obey you. He doesn't say that. Now, in that world, 
in that Greco-Roman household that most of these people are born into? Is that what will be go is going on? Will, of course, that's how they will all assume it. But we have to look at what is the question Paul is addressing here. And so to help us understand that, I want to give an analogy, okay? I want to step back for a second. So Jesus was one time asked a question by some Jewish religious leaders. They basically said, should we pay taxes? And Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So does that mean that Jesus was saying that empire, Caesar's the emperor, that empire is a good thing? Does that mean that Jesus was, was telling us how government should function for all time? And that if you want to obey the words of Jesus, which said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, then you should be opposed to democracy. You should be opposed to human rights. You should be in favor of a empire that conquers uh, and destroys enemies for the sake of Rome. No, of course not. Jesus wasn't asked the question, what is the best government for all time? People that were already under the control of that empire were asking, how do we live well in this imperfect, broken system in which we find ourselves? This is exactly the question which Paul is answering here. Paul has already said there's no slave or master. There's no male or female in Christ. So if Paul was asked the question, should there be these household rules? Should there be masters and slaves for all time? I think he would give a very, very different answer than the one he gives here. And by the way, in 1 Corinthians 7, where he lays out something very similar, where he says, slaves, this is how you can act well towards your masters. He actually says, as, as like an aside, he kind of assumes everybody all already knows this. By the way, slaves, if you can get free, of course you should. Yeah, of course. Of course you should get free if you can. Paul is not endorsing patriarchy. Paul is not saying these household, this way of organizing the household is the best way to do it forever. Paul is certainly not saying slavery should be instituted forever. What he, the question he's addressing after already saying we're completely equal in Christ is so what do I do if I'm trapped as a slave? What do I do if I'm trapped in this unjust household system? And what he does is he picks out the relations that can be remade in love, and he says nothing about, he refuses to endorse the unjust rights, particularly the unjust rights of the male paterfamilias, which builds the whole system. Do you see what he's doing? He's remaking this unjust system from the inside out. One, by utterly changing the motivation saying it's not because of something intrinsic to who this per this man, this paterfamilias is that you should serve him. Two, by only endorsing the obligations that can be remade according to this vision of love and saying nothing about the rights that undergird the whole thing. But the third reason and the last reason is this. Some of you might be noticing something. I said that every one of these relationships, the reason, the motivation why they are told to act in service and love to the other is because it's related to Jesus. It's fitting in the Lord. It pleases the Lord. You have a master in heaven. What about verse 19? Doesn't seem that Jesus is mentioned or the Lord is mentioned. Well, the reason that New Testament scholars say that is, is basically he is mentioned. It's just implicit. That word there, love your wives, agape your wives. That's what is commanded to husbands. And by this point in Christian history, um, most scholars will say that word had taken on a sort of very definitive Christ-defined definition. When Christians thought of what does it mean to love, they immediately thought of Jesus. So basically, Jesus is mentioned in verse 19 just by mentioning agape. So what is Paul saying then? When he says, husbands, love your wives, and basically, in different ways, husbands, love your, your children, and also masters, love your slaves. He doesn't say that explicitly, but it's, it's implied in what he says. Well, Christians would have known what love is. They would have looked to the final chapters of John's gospel. They would have remembered the definitive redefinition of love, which Jesus offered. How did Jesus show them what love is? He tied a cloth around his waist. He got down on his hands and knees and he washed their feet. Then he served them a meal. And the way he described what he did there is by the word doulos. It's not the word servant. 
as many people think. It's the word slave. In Philippians chapter 2, when Jesus described his mission to earth, uh, well, when Paul described Jesus' mission to earth, sorry, it says Jesus did not count equality with God. He did not count his natural uh, divineness, something to be held on to, but he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a, same word, by the way, slave. See, I know some people will think, fine, you've made a sort of, you know, complicated case. But Paul still says to the woman, submit to the man. And the man only has to love the woman. Paul still says to the slave, obey the master. And the master only has to serve, care for, provide for, i.e. love the slave. That still seems unfair. <laughs> it's only unfair if you don't define love the way that Christians do. Because what does it mean to love another person if you define it the way Jesus does? It means to voluntarily, not because of who, their nature, but because of who, what you choose, because of what Christ has done for you, to voluntarily take the role of a servant or even of a slave for them. And what do slaves do? Submit to the other. So what is Paul saying here? He's using different words. He's not saying men and women are exactly the same, but he's describing the process of voluntarily submitting to the other in love in two different, using two different terms, because that's what love means for a Christian. He's saying women, just like Jesus knew that the, the, the disciples whose feet he was washing, they didn't have a better nature than him. They weren't intrinsically better than him. In fact, he was God. He was better than them. But nonetheless, he took the role of a slave out of love for them. Husbands. You do exactly the same thing. You love your wife, as Ephesians says, as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Voluntarily taking the role of a slave for them. Voluntarily submitting for them. By the way, Ephesians is almost an exact parallel of Colossians. The, 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 the two closest texts, he enters into the same household codes again. And it becomes even clearer there. Because the whole passage begins with him saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He's actually calling for mutual submission and he uses different words. Again, he's not saying men and women are the, exactly the same, but he's, he starts the whole passage saying, basically what I'm going to go on to describe is the way you can each choose to voluntarily submit in love to the other in the roles that society has placed you in. Here's how you can remake those love. You can meet, remake those roles in light of the equality you have in Christ and in light of the love which you have received from him. He does the exact same thing with masters and slaves. People miss the, the most incredible part of this description of the household. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ and masters treat your slaves in the same way. Treat your slaves exactly as you would wish to be treated. Serve them. Be a slave for them. Because that's how Christ treated you. This passage could not be further away from affirming inequality. It is a radical vision of everyone in society sacrificing in love for the other. Now, did the church always get this right? Of course not. Of course not. Um, but sometimes they did, by the way, more than we sometimes might expect. There's a great, um, oh, I'll come back to that. There was a document in the early church called the Apostolic Constitutions. This was, um, it was so important that some people wanted to include it in the Bible. It was one of the defining texts that kind of told churches how to operate. And it, it understood. Um, when people read this in the right context, they understood how revolutionary it was. This is what it says. Let the master love his slave. Let him, con let him consider wherein they are equal, even as he is a man. I think that probably means human there even in the fact that they are both ultimately equal because they're both men or men and women united in Christ. And so what's being enjoined here, what's being commanded here is a way of remaking society through love, using love and sacrificial service to create 
an equal society. Now, I wish I could, at this point, I'm going to have to cut out about 20 minutes of my sermon. I know people will have all sorts of questions. I wish I could talk more about how to apply this today. But basically, what I just want to do is lay out this vision. I want you to be challenged. If you think that all we do is read a text like this and apply it the exact same way as they did in the first century. That's not what Paul's speaking to here. Again, Paul's not saying this is how household should look for all time. He's saying, if you're born into this system, how do you remake it in light of the radical revolutionary gospel of Jesus Christ? That will be challenging for some of us with a more conservative disposition. There's also something very challenging if you have a more liberal disposition. Because oftentimes today, the idea that the way to remake society is through loving your enemies, loving the persecutor, loving the one who institutes injustice, uh, injustice, that's not a popular idea. Furthermore, the idea that you might even have to serve them, that's extremely unpopular. But the Christian message is this. The Christian message is there's no way of loving. There's no real way of loving. You can pretend to be loving. You can use the words love all the time. But if you actually want to love someone in the cut and thrust and difficulty of life, you will have to treat them better than they are. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what Paul Paul says in another book in Philippians when he says, treat others as more significant than yourself. If you want to love people in the imperfect, unequal, broken world we live in, you will have to voluntarily take the role even of a slave. I think, though, we also see how revolutionary this was. I know some of us, we, we might be tempted from our 21st century horse to just say, well, why did Paul have to go through all this trouble? Why did he have to speak to the people that were in this difficult situation? Why couldn't he have just said, slavery is bad, end of discussion. Misogyny is bad, end of discussion. Before we do that, let's actually remember that Paul's strategy worked. See, this isn't just a hypothetical discussion. This isn't just an academic discussion. This is what I was going to say before. Here's four books. Nietzsche on the genealogy of morals, the great critic of Christianity, Charles Taylor, Tom Holland, Larry Seedentop. All four of these books make the argument that the modern vision of equality, which we are using to critique Paul and Jesus, actually came from Paul and Jesus. That Nietzsche calls Christianity the slave's religion. The very idea that that makes us uncomfortable as we read this biblical text came from the Bible. It's rooted in this theology that all people are equal in Christ. Paul's vision of remaking society from the inside out through love took a long, difficult, winding history where oftentimes many Christians were on the wrong side, but ultimately it worked. Ultimately, the the society that we live in, I I shouldn't say that, it didn't fully work, it's still working. And And so this isn't some sort of liberal view of progress of everything getting better, but the fact that we now look at that Roman society and we are disgusted by it is the impact of Christianity on our world. It's the fact that Paul's vision of remaking society through love, though it was often abused and misused and forgotten, it ultimately has borne fruit. By the way, once again, Christianity's enemies from the beginning understood this. Celsus, the most famous critic of early Christianity, he was the sort of Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins of the early church. He critiqued Christianity. Why? Because Christianity is made up of only slaves, women, and little children. When they heard these passages from Paul, They heard how revolutionary it was. They heard the vision of radical equality in Christ that he was proclaiming. So what does it mean now? Well, look, I don't think something that to me, there's nothing more significant than this when it comes to what the gospel is all about. And so I can't just say, oh, apply it by doing this particular thing. What this should offer us is the motivation. 
The motive, most of us know, most of us want at some level a more equal society. We want to treat others more equally. We don't want to be judging people by, by where they're from or by their class or by what they can offer us. But what most of us lack is the motivation, the motivation to actually sacrifice in love for another person. And so what's the motivation this offers us? Well, first off, it offers us a beautiful vision. I want you to imagine for a second that you were at this small house church in Colossae, which received this message. Or maybe imagine that you were in the other one. He actually was writing to two churches, as will become clear at the end of the book. He was writing to a church in Laodicea, Laodicea, another small house church, meeting, by the way, in the home of a woman. You arrive into a woman's home, who many Christ, who many scholars think, by the way, that would have been leading the gathering. You come round the table, and sitting on your left is a patrician one of the, the ruling classes of the city who has a huge estate and hundreds of slaves. Sitting on your right is a day laborer. Sitting down from him is a child who's sitting at table with the adults. Next to him is a slave. And the slave brings out a hunk of bread. They've saved, perhaps they've even stolen. And the ruler brings out some of the finest wine from his vineyard. And he pours it into a glass. And he hands it to the slave who's never been served by anyone in his life. This is the vision which remade and is remaking. And God, we pray, please remake us still. The Western world, we are still a, a society of radical inequality, of course. So how do we begin? How do we start? We have to go back to another room, even before that one. We have to realize that if we as a community and we are individuals are going to institute this radical vision of serving people in love, people that aren't essentially better than us, people that don't deserve it, the only way we will ever have the inner strength and resolve to do that is if the place we begin is with the God of the universe who made all things, the great king above all gods and emperors and authorities, if we begin allowing him to wash our feet. If we begin knowing that the only way we can live in this sort of love towards people that don't deserve it is if we know ourselves as recipients of a love and a grace that we utterly do not deserve. This is the dynamism, the power which can remake our society today, again, according to this vision of love from the inside out. God, let justice roll down. God, let the good news of Jesus, the radical love and sacrifice, may it be real for us this morning. May we taste it as we sing to you. May we go from here knowing we are recipients of a love we do not deserve. And may we therefore be agents of reconciliation, of equality, and of justice. Amen. As always, I know, sorry, Xander, I know people might have questions about that, and I'm more than happy to chat. There's so much stuff I didn't, wasn't able to say, and I do apologize. Xander, take us away. Yeah, it's great, Jared. Thanks. I'm really struck by the fact that we love because God first loved us. So actually, the way that we are shaped um, isn't by hammering onto us, but rather being loved, being shown. And actually, yeah, let's be worshipping God and praying that the Holy Spirit will change us as uh, God has done that with us. The doorbell has just rung, so I'm going to chat that Louis getting that. Give me one sec. Don't get that every day. <laughs> Smile and wave, Jared. <sighs> yeah, 
But we, we're going to praise God um, and also recognize how he has served us and we can follow after him.
Lord, I pray that you may help us to to love the world as you have, with the same heart. I recognise our pain and our injuries and our circumstances will impact the way that we view others and our, our pain might make us struggle to love. But Lord, we pray that you might fill those gaps in our hearts, that you may um, clothe us with a mindset and a love that is only from you. Lord, may we see a world transformed by people who live after your own heart. And I pray that you will open our eyes to blindness uh, for your sake and for the people of this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me conclude the service with this benediction. As we part, remember, the Spirit of God is already at work within you, giving you both the desire and the strength to do what pleases him. So go on, uh, so go from here with joy to love and serve God and one another. And may the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be among you and within you. Amen. Well, uh, once again, thank you for uh, coming to our service. And again, if you would like, please join us uh, on Zoom in about five minutes uh, for coffee and tea and a quick chat. All right. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep. Jesus Christ.